from Mark chapter 6. I'll be reading verses 30 through 34. Today I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourself and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. God. A lot of times in the church, you will hear, you know, someone or see someone in writing invite you to participate. They'll come up to you, especially if they're, they're like me, a pastor, and they'll say, I have an opportunity for you, an opportunity to, to be in mission or to be in service. And it's amazing the number of times you know, people will say, oh, you know, I just don't have the gifts for that, or I, I, I'm not prepared for that, or I just, I, I can't do anything like that. It's almost amazing the number of times people say that. Now, lots of times when people are asked to serve or, or help in God's kingdom, they say yes. But many times they begin feeling inadequate for one reason or another. I know that here lately I've been really, really thinking about um, my daughter going to, to seminary. Uh, and it's made me think about my own journey uh, to seminary and how I resisted the, the call to, to serve God in this particular way as a, as a pastor, mainly because I felt somewhat inadequate in that. I felt like I, I couldn't do it. I, I felt inadequate in a lot of ways. I mean, if you... If, if you knew my family, not very many of them in my family had gone to college. Um, my brothers and I uh, were the first three from that particular part of the family to go to college. And I would be the first person from my entire family to ever go on to a postgraduate degree. Um, that was intimidating to even think about it. It was scary to me. And then, you know, to make matters worse, I, I chose Duke to go to, okay? I mean, here I was, going to be the first one in my family to go for a postgraduate degree, and I choose a school like Duke. I mean, I could have gone some small place, but I didn't. I didn't. It was intimidating and it was scary, but there was one thing that got me through that. And that is because I heard time and time again, you are called by God to do the work you are going to do. Hearing that over and over again, not only got me through that time, but it gets me through those Sunday mornings that, well, follow those weeks when all I've heard is negativity in the world, negativity in the church. And I don't feel much like preaching or leading in any way. 
It gets me through those mornings when I have to get up and, and hear about tragic deaths on a, a boat in a lake. That I can get up and, and say, there is good news, folks. There is good news. Because I've heard time and time again, you are called by God to do the work you do. I hear that over and over again. But you see, those are not just words that I'm, I, 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 I hear on my own. They're not just words that I hear from, from people saying them to me. I hear those words, and I, I first heard those words as I listen to God, as I practiced my spirituality. This passage that we, we, we just read from, from Mark's Gospel is, is one of my personal favorites, in, the, in Mark's Gospel at least. Because, well, well for one reason, it proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that um, there were no United Methodists among the first disciples, okay? Because it says in there somewhere they had no leisure to eat, all right? We know there couldn't have been any United Methodists. Someone would have had a covered dish someplace, all right? But I, I really, really love this passage because it shows Jesus saying to his disciples, come away with me to a deserted place. Come away and get some rest. I know you're tired. I know you're worn down. And I know you need to take some time to recharge. For you see, that's what spiritual practices are all about. That's what praying is about. That's what uh, worship is about. That's, that's what communion is about. That's what fasting is about. That's what searching the scriptures is about. That's what all spiritual practices are about. Taking time to be alone with God, to rest, to recharge, so that we can hear what God has to say. And you see in this passage, Jesus takes the disciples off by themselves, drops them off. He sees the crowds. He sees the people who, who are in need. And he doesn't send the disciples back to minister to them. They had their job. They had their task. Jesus went to those sheep who were like a shepherd. Who were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus went to those people who were like sheep without a shepherd. I'll get it right here in a second. He ministered to them while the disciples took care of the spiritual practices they needed to do. And that's why I love this passage so much. It's because it's a reminder to us that we, we can do nothing if we don't take the time to listen to God to be with God, to grow with God. We can do little unless we take the time to listen to what God says to us. I can do the work that I do because I am called by God to do that work. And I can hear that when I take time to pray, when I take part in communion, when I fast, when I search the scriptures, when I do anything that draws me closer to God, even taking Sabbath rest. And this is true for any of us. There was once a, a story of a a bishop who came to, to visit um, her preachers. And uh, she was visiting with them and, and, and was encouraging them to, to take one hour a day to spend in prayer and scripture reading. He said, one hour a day 
Spend that in prayer and scripture reading. Everyone in, in her group needed to do that. And this one preacher came up to her afterwards and he said to her, he said, Bishop, I, I don't know what you're talking about here. A whole hour in scripture and prayer, I, I, my, my schedule's just too busy for that. I've got this to do, I've got people to see, I've got these places I have to go, I have to prepare sermons every week. I, I serve three churches and I'm spread out all over the place. I just don't have time for a whole hour a day. And the bishop says, you know what, you're absolutely right, you don't. You need about three hours a day. And so I'll be calling and checking to make sure you do it. See, it's not about, you know, it's not really about the quantity of time as much as it is about the quality. If we think we're too busy to spend time in spiritual practices, then the thing is, we need to spend more time in spiritual practices. Because it's that busyness that's distracting us from hearing God. It's that busyness that keeps us from hearing the Holy Spirit. About two years ago, I took upon a, a spiritual practice myself of um, never saying I'm busy. And I've gotten pretty good at it. You know, if someone asks me, how's your week going? I'll tell them I'm blessed. I'll tell them I've seeing God in a lot of different places. I'll tell them I'm frustrated. But one thing I won't say is that I'm busy. Because I don't want to be too busy to see God and to be able to attend to God. Nor do I want any of you to be too busy to see God or attend to what God has to say to you. Another great story I heard about spiritual practices and our, our need, and, and actually not our need, but the blessing we get from these spiritual practices, comes to us from a, a story out of a church here in West Virginia, the Dallas United Methodist Church. There may be two or three people in the room, maybe, maybe four that have heard, ha, heard of Dallas United Methodist. Did you know we had a Dallas United Methodist Church in West Virginia? How many knew that? Yeah. Oh, there, I had it about right, three. There were three that knew there was a Dallas. It's way up north, Dallas up north. Can you figure that? Okay, it's in the northern district of our, of our conference. And the, the preacher there, Reverend Lisa Fox, felt compelled to to get the congregation together to pray and uh, was led to, to ask them to pray at the same time every day. I don't remember the time. Aaron, you... What is it? 714. 714. It had something to do with some scripture that they had read together. And, 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 and they started praying. They set their alarms on their on their uh, uh, handheld devices or you know, phones or uh, at home, their you know, watches or whatever they had, they set. So that 7.14 and twice a day, 7.14 in the morning, 7.14 in the evening, everybody in their congregation would at least be praying. Fascinating things began to happen because they took this opportunity to to practice a spiritual practice. Uh, the ministry in the church picked up and um, people began coming up with ideas of things to do. Ministry flourished because people started hearing from God. Attendance tripled, I believe, in that church. It went from about 30 people to 90 in that little church the blessings of God began to be poured out when people began practicing together the spiritual practices of prayer. You see, this is not an obligation we have. It's a gift 
Jesus gives to us. A gift he gave to his disciples those, those years ago when he told them and took them to a deserted place and said, pray. Let's get away because you haven't even had time to eat. Now you know Jesus is not going to leave United Methodists without time to eat, right? And he's certainly not going to leave us without time to pray, to search the scriptures, to commune and worship, to Christian conference with one another, to practice any of the spiritual practices that show us the grace of God. That's a gift Jesus wants to give to us. And I pray that we receive them. And maybe as a special way of receiving them today, maybe we can, well, I've been preaching on discipleship for about five weeks now. Did you all know that? Marks of discipleship, had you caught that on the bulletin the last five weeks? Actually six, if you count the introduction. And someone pointed out to me midway that I preach from the book of Mark all the time, except once. And they said, oh, you ruined your marks of discipleship right there. But I've been preaching on these for a very real reason. So that we can grow in our discipleship. And so I'm going to offer a special challenge today. Since it says in uh, chapter 6, verse 31... Jesus said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourself and rest for a while. I'm going to challenge us to make that our time of prayer. 6.31. I'll be happy if you do it once a day, folks. Okay? I'll be thrilled if you're up at 6.31 in the morning and want to do it then. Okay? Okay? But I wonder, how many of you would be willing to go ahead and, and set an alarm right now? You get, I know you got your, those of you, find your clock. I can find my clock. You all want to, you want to get in on this? All right. You want to come in? Come on. Oh, you don't have the screen down. Uh, we can at least show them online what I'm doing, so you can get on that. I'm going to add an alarm here for six. 31, maybe. Let's see. I can't get it to move to 1. I got 2, I got ah, 6.31. I got it at a.m., okay. And I'll just set it there, and there it is. I've got mine set. How many set yours? Okay, and here's what I want us to be praying about. That we will all grow in our discipleship. That's all I want us to be praying about. That we and our church will grow in our discipleship. I'll set my other one, the 6.31 p.m. later, since that was so hard for me to get one. I'll work on the other one too, okay? But uh, join me in that time of prayer, at least once a day, and we'll watch what happens as God answers it. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs>